Good morning and welcome to Winterberg in Germany's Hochsauerland. We are in it's Sunday morning and a big crowd on hand despite the threat of a little bit of snow which has just started to fall, ready for the final day of competition in the European Championships. First up, lunchtime racing for women's skeleton, the first of our two heats. Hello everybody, I'm Martin Haven, alongside me US slider Nathan Crumpton in action on this track yesterday. Nathan, what are we looking for here in Winterberg? You're looking to build as much speed as possible on this track. It can be a little bit tricky. It's one of those tracks that can be easy to get down, but very difficult to get down quickly. So we're looking at the POV here. We've got a long, flat start, and then you enter into Curve Zero, the only track with a Curve Zero in it because it was added 29 years after the original track was built. Going into Curve One, into Two, which is known as the Omega Curve, given the shape and the three pressures into it. And then you go into Curve Three, which actually exits uphill going into Curve Four. If you make a mistake going uphill, it's going to compound itself and you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Here you're going to set yourself up going into the Kreisel. Kreisel is a 270 degree curve, multi-pressure, a place where your race can be made or lost, especially on the exit right there as you go into curve eight, setting you up for the critical curve nine. Nine is where you really start to build some speed. Kicks you out, you skip curve 10 right into 11, and here you're approaching your top speed as you enter the lower labyrinth. Right out of here, just before the zeal curve, you'll hit your top speed, and then you have another uphill as you cross the finish line, trying to maintain your form, and hopefully with a good result. And of course, with snow on the agenda, we may have all sorts of other factors to deal with. Deal with. Lizzie Arnold, the Olympic champion, the record holder on this track, Yelena Nikitin, the Olympic bronze medalist, the start record holder here as well. Weather, light, snow. Five minutes ago, Nathan, we're just looking out the window going, oh, it looks quite clear. This is Florida. Don't like the weather? Wait five minutes, or in this case, maybe a little longer. Ice temperature exactly. minus three, so that's pretty much what it was in training, but the snow throws up all sorts of other problems. It does. It, these ladies have had the short end of the stick when it comes to the weather this season. All three races, they have had snow, they've had variable conditions. I know each and every one of them is just hoping for some clear skies and hopefully to have a fair race here today. And you've got to make your runner choice kind of based on a guesstimate, haven't you, of what the weather's going to be like, because you can't change it during the race. Precisely. You have to make your runner cho choice before the race, and you have to tune it to the conditions of the ice, to what you think the snow may do, and it really is, to some degree, a guessing game. We saw Lizzie Arnold there, like everybody else, warming up on that little bit of road down beside the start area. Nice and slushy and slippery and just exactly what you don't really need. So our start draw today, 24 athletes, 20 fastest, will go through into the second heat. And the Netherlands, Joske Lecant will be first off. Julia Kanakina will be the second to go and will go all the way down the order to 24th spot, Katie Ulender from the USA. In previous years, the first 10 would be from the top 10 in the World Cup points in a random draw. Now it's 11 to 15 in points go into a random draw for the first five spots, which is a double bonus, I think, because it gives us a chance to see what maybe some of the developing sliders can do on the track, and it also gets them a chance to be on TV right at the start. It does, and the other thing that it can do is it mixes up the start order, especially when weather comes into play. And it can really change up how an athlete approaches the track, approach, approaches the race, and it can really uh, throw it into the mix. The Oscar Lacant through corner zero without too much of a skid. Quite a lot of snow in the start group, so starts are not going to be fast this morning. No, probably not. Hopefully the track workers, they get in there, they clean the grooves out as much as possible, make it as fair a race as they can. And uh, Yasuka's looking all right on the sled so far. She's coming into, into the uphill section, then going into curve five, setting it up for curve six into the critical Kreisel. She has a nice, clean entry into Kreisel. Just trying to control those waves just a little bit so she doesn't flop off. Looking clean into the setup curve for nine. Trying to stay off the slider's right wall. It looks like she may have just made some light contact with it as she comes into 11. Uh, trying to build as much speed as possible, staying relaxed on the sled. Some of these women will be approaching 80 miles an hour down here. It's at 125.1 kilometers an hour for Yasuka and she crosses the finish line. 59-22, the all-time track record is a 57-4. There's Lucy Chaffer, former Aussie slider, who's over here coaching for a few weeks. 77.7 .7 miles an hour down at the bottom, chin on the ice. That's fairly fast by anybody's judgment. 59-22 then, Jos Lecomte sets the benchmark. 
You can see how white the grooves are. That's snow that hasn't really been swept out. I think you'll see some of these women trying to get a very quick start off the block, hopefully to get the sled away as quickly as possible, just so it saves a little bit of extra time and they get a little bit of extra speed at the very top of the track. So Joske Lecant is the first one down. Next up is Russia's Yulia Kanakina, former ballet dancer. And uh, who knew that ballet dancers turned into such sprinters? Now, she has got great speed at the start. She really does. She also has a lot of excellent hip flexibility, which is what you need to run in that awkward position as you're bent over, trying to push that sled as fast as you can. She gets away in a 5.88. I've got to say it's probably a snow-affected time. Uh, she's going to try and maintain as much velocity as she can going down this track. But already second slider into the race, and we're seeing potentially some, uh, some snow-affected times. Luckily, the rest of the track is covered. Uh, all the way down from curve zero through to the finish. So hopefully she can build some speed and gain back some of that time. You can see already snow flurries in her wake behind her, around through the Kreisel corner. Comes out cleanly. It's a very nice exit from Kreisel going into curve nine. She does not take that hit, which is always nice. Gets a little bit of a flop off of the end of nine as she enters the lower labyrinth here. Holding her lines pretty decently, trying to stay smooth. Falling back, unfortunately, only 123 kilometers an hour. I don't know if she'll be too happy with that, but uh, we'll see what the rest of the field does. Nine tenths of a second and more behind Joska Lecant with a 60.18. One of the problems with the weather when it turns to rain or snow is that it's not constant for everybody. And of course, that's what we want to produce is a level playing field. Exactly. And that's what the track workers are, are working really hard to try and achieve to make it as even as possible for all of the athletes. But you can't control the weather. Well, a little gust of wind at the start. You're only sprinting for that three or four seconds. A gust of wind can make a big difference, not two or three tenths out of that sprint. And Kanakina certainly, you would expect to start a lot faster than Joska Lacan. She started slower, and that followed her all the way down. Blowing a kiss to the crowd. Belgian noise at the top of the track. We've often called this the Dutch Alps. We're now renaming it the Belgian Highlands because it is close to Belgium, as well as the Netherlands, and brings in a lot of fans. This is Kimi Marmens. Kimi, she's a great slider. She started out with the German program. She really knows how to navigate a slide. She's had a tough time this season. Really rough start to the year in Whistler. She came off of her sled. She was disqualified, and she's really trying to work her way back up into the rankings and gain a few spots as best as she can. Her head's low. She's maintaining a good position. I think she's comfortable on this track, and she's just going to be trying to build as much speed as possible. And she went to the sports high school in Berchtesgaden when she was young, and so she'll know the Koenigsegg track better than any other, perhaps. That's where she would have started to slide, but as a German slider, she'll have knowledge of this track, former German slider. 1100 up on Joske Lecant, Battle of the Low Countries. Belgium in front of the Netherlands. And she is putting together a really nice run here. Her, her lines are looking solid. She looks relaxed on the sled. She's holding her aerodynamic form really well. Good speed, 127. Nice and she'll the... go right into first place. Yeah. Nice through the final corner. And there's the Belgian coach, Martin Rettel from Austria, also coaching a whole host of small nations. And we'll see some of their athletes as well in the field. And Martin's done a really great job with his athletes this year. The Olympic silver medalist from Salt Lake City. He's worked closely with Kim here, with Ander from Spain on the men's side, with Maria uh, Montahano, and also with Reese Thornberry of New Zealand. And he's done a lot with those athletes, and they're really coming into their own. See her steering there with the hips. You use head, shoulders, knees, and toes, all of the body mass moving around on this little seesaw runner sled. A glorified cafeteria tray, as we sometimes <laughs> like to say. Downhill suicide tea trays. Kendall Westenberg, your teammate from the USA. How's she been going in training? Kendall has been hit or miss. She is a great driver. She's a natural driver. She learned with me at Utah Olympic Park under Lincoln DeWitt, and she has a good feel for the sled, but she is frustrated with this track. She, it, it has some subtleties that you really don't pick up until you're here for a number of years. And Kendall, sometimes she gets it and sometimes she doesn't. She's looking for a good run. She's also been switching sleds back and forth. She's been going from the Protostar sled back to the Bromley that she was originally on. Today, she chose to go with the Bromley sled, 
and I think she just feels more comfortable on it, and hopefully she gets the result that she's looking for. Well, your sled has to be like a handmade pair of shoes, and it has to fit you perfectly, not just body-wise, but what you want to do, how you want to drive. Exactly. There is something to be said for being one with the sled, so to speak, as cliche as that may sound, but you have to feel comfortable. You're moving at a very high rate of speed on these sleds. You have to be as calm as possible. You have to get into that zen-like state as you're sliding down the ice. And for Kendall today, she's she's chosen the Bromley sled for that. She's having a decent run. She's flopping off just a tiny bit off of the corners, and she is unfortunately bleeding some speed out. Only 126 kilometers an hour puts her into fourth place at the finish line. 60.58 slide. 78 at the bottom of the track. Again, 6.51 start time. You've got to think that some of these times are a long way away from what we would get in ideal conditions. It really is. I, I've got to say that's got to be something to do with the snow and the grooves and just losing too much velocity off of the top. There she is, coming off of curve nine, getting a little bit of height there. You, that's actually okay. You want a little bit of height there to push you in early into 11. It's not a bad line at all. Uh, I've got to say it's got to be the start that's, that's hampering Kendall today. And the snow is getting harder and harder. This is a really tough break for Canada's Jane Channel, really running into the teeth of the snow here. You can see it coming down. It's coming down hard. And that, look at the snow. You can see the runners just plowing their way through the start. I think that may be the first time I've ever seen a mark left by a toe drag as well. There's so much snow there. There really is. And that, it's going to be disappointing for some of these ladies here. But they're doing their best. It is an outdoor sport. And luckily, the rest of the track is covered that it, which is a new addition to the track here in Winterberg they covered curve zero for the first time and it should help even out the playing field a little bit for these ladies we well, can see on some of the straights and some of the crossovers the snow just drifts in and just builds up and accumulates if you hit that it's like hitting the brakes it is absolutely you're trying to find as clean a line as possible uh, Jane's putting together a, a decent run here she's looking relaxed on her sled and she's got her feet together uh, we'll just see if the time adds up. A little bit of a flop there down in the lower labyrinth, but 124.6, still holding it together as best as she can. She's going to go into third place at the line ahead of Yulia Kanakina and Kendall Wessenberg. But uh, again, 577 start. Definitely, she'd be hoping for something better than that in She's any so other conditions than these. Absolutely. Jane is a fantastic starter. She works so hard in the off season. She's one of the fastest ladies on the Canadian team. Uh, normally, you'd see a time somewhere in the 530s, I would say, for Jane. That would be a, a normal race day with a fast groove, but the snow is just throwing everybody off, That's unfortunately. Takes a little toast here into corner zero, but uh, so the jury now are going to be faced with a little bit of a dilemma, and the next 10 athletes will tell us a lot. Kim Marmons leads from Jos de Leconte with the first five sleds down. We're now into the 6 to 15 start group. These are the top 10 athletes in the World Cup standings. Laura Dees in the random draw pulls start draw number six. Her fiance Richard is here supporting her this weekend. Boyfriend, he said, he was corrected immediately by Don Parsons. Uh, fiance, <laughs> no wriggling out of that. Laura's another excellent starter. We saw her pushing 530s in training. We'll see what the snow does to her here at the start. A 6 0 too. That's, uh, it is unfortunately slow. I think a little bit of extra snow just got in her way. And we'll see if she can gain any of the speed back down the track here. Well, what you would hope now for everybody else is that it rain, uh, snows about the same amount, so everybody Correct. is equally hampered. Exactly, and that's what the jury is going to be looking for. They yeah. do have it within their power to call the race after a single heat, if need be, if the weather really doesn't cooperate. But we'll just have to play it by ear and uh, see what happens with these next sleds. Yesterday's two-man bobsleigh race, we had a clear first heat, and then it snowed like billio. We delayed the second start for half an hour. We almost got a clean race all the way through. But first and second, maybe third sled out, had the best of the conditions. Lordy's 1.4 seconds back in fifth place. 125 kilometers per hour. She'll be crossing the finish line in fifth place. 1.5 seconds behind. I wonder if she's ever come down this track slower than a minute, 0.39 seconds. Probably never in competition. 77.7 .7 miles an hour. You can see the girls aren't uh, trying to slow down. They're using the outrun. 
And it's slick there on that outrun, too. They've got to watch their steps as they carry that heavy sled back down to the finish dock. Okay, a little swerve up corner zero, yeah, unavoidable. Toe kicks out just a little bit, trying to counterbalance the sled just to get the right entry into curve one. Uh, that critical section where it goes uphill into two, you've got to maintain as much speed as possible as Laura tries to navigate the, the down ramp to the finish. Next up for Germany, Anna Fernstedt made her World Cup debut this season. And one of Germany's bright young hopes hasn't got the fastest of starts, but she should be able to find some speed on this track. She is an excellent driver. I was talking to her before the race, and she, she says that this is one of the most frustrating tracks for her as she comes out and she just clips the slider's right side out of curve zero, which is going to hurt her velocity even more. 56 kilometers an hour, one of the slower velocities that we've seen. But if there's anyone who can find some speed down this track, it's going to be a German on one of their own tracks. Well, we've had an awful lot of non-German winners on this track. Tina Hermann won last year from Jacqueline Lerling, both Germans, but Lizzie Arnold won the World Championships here two years ago, and she won the World Cup race the year previously. Shelley Rudman before her, Amy Goff, last German winner here. Kirsten Simkoviak retired after the Vancouver Games, and it was in the run-up to the Games that she won. So Germany have got a long time since they've won on this track. Well, we'll see if Anna can help pull out a win today. Uh, they also have a few other very strong German sliders that are coming up later in the order. As Anna falls into fifth place, 1.4 seconds behind. Yeah, there's some very big gaps in the field, as we see when we get our graphic at the end of the top ten. She is 500s behind Yulia Kanakina of Russia. She is 1600s ahead of Laura Dees. That's the fourth, fifth, sixth group. And of course, the athletes have spikes on their shoes, but they're not on the back of the shoes, only on the ball of the shoe. So when they're walking downhill with a heel on the ice, it's just as slippery there. Correct, yes, it's a brush spike with two or 300 tiny metal spikes in the front of the shoe to give us grip as we run, uh, especially in the ice. But. Uh, in the snow, it can sometimes fill up with snow, and then it, it hurts. OK, we're now hearing from the top of the track as we watch Anna Fernstedt, and you saw those slow-motion pictures really exaggerate how much snow there is, but we are clearly not in a position where the weather is going to clear up. The jury, I understand, have taken the decision to restart the heat. So we will go back to scratch in about 30 minutes and hope that when we go from the top again with all our athletes, then we will have a chance to get a clean race. Now, in a way, you feel a little bit sorry for Joskala Konkin Marmans, who were the first ones out, but we've got seven athletes down now, covered by nearly 1.8 seconds. Some of the best in the world are a second and a half away from two-year, you know, second-year sliders. So here's the, the jury with all the team captains, all the coaches giving it their decision. And do you know what I mean? When we started, there was a little light snow. Now it's a proper heavy snowfall. If you're waiting in the changing room, would you be in agreement with this? I think I would. The snow is coming down hard enough now that it did affect up some people in the later uh, uh, entries into sliding. And it's, uh, it's something that you do try to make as constant as possible for the athletes. And it's a shame, really. Um, I know these ladies, they were really hoping for their first weather-free race of the year because they have been suffering through it every single race so far. We're halfway through the World Cup season yeah. and it's been really unfortunate in terms of the weather luck for them. Well, we definitely had a, a, a season last year where they snow followed us everywhere. You see Martin Rettel in the blue Ayrton Senna cap there, as vocal as ever. Now, Martin Rettel with Kim, Marlsman, Kim Marmons leading is not necessarily in favour of a restart, but I think everybody else would say, I mean, look, look at the crowd. You know, when yes, they walked in all... here, they weren't white. Exactly. They're all white now. I, I don't think there's much of a chance here that you could call it a fair race if you just let it go. No, it's tough. It's a tough decision for the jury, definitely. Uh, it's hard because the track is not fully covered at the start. It's really that first 50 meters. As soon as you cross the timing eye at 15 meters, there's a 50 meter stretch where the groove ends that's just getting pounded with snow, and that's what's causing the dilemma here. Well, now you're going to find out how we earn our money. 
Watch insiders go down. It's all done for us. It's on TV. Yeah, People absolutely. can see what's happening. Now we have an indeterminate period of time about which to talk about skeletons. So thank goodness you're in here because you've got the knowledge and, and the ability to talk. So, OK, right now, sure. the athletes that are down at the bottom are getting in a van, which will then scrabble its way back up the hill. You're in the changing room. You are in your race suit. You've hopefully got your bib on. And you're in your countdown to when you're going to get your helmet, your sled, go to the start line. So you've now got to reset, but you don't know when we're going to restart. What, exactly. What's everybody doing downstairs in the warm, apart it, from being glad they're in the warm? You have to stay loose. You have to stay warmed up. You have to get your muscles primed, ready to go to push that sled uh, whenever you're, you may be called. There is a lot of precise timing in skeleton, especially with the starts. We get told before the race, we'll have, say, two minutes before each racer or two minutes and 10 seconds before each racer. And that gives us an internal rhythm where we know how to time our warm up, how to time our sled preparation, how to just adjust mentally to the race itself. And when you have something like this, where the race can be canceled or it's up in the air or you get a heat that needs to be rerun. It really throws a wrench into your plans and it shows, uh, it, you'll see the athletes who are the most flexible, they'll be the ones who come out ahead, the ones and, who can adapt to, to the changing conditions. And it's mentally flexible, not physically flexible. I mean, how many, yes. how many starts would you do in an off-season day of training? How many runs would you do? Maybe three, maybe, maybe four? Three. Yes, four would be pushing it, depending on the track. Okay. Usually most training days will do two runs down the track. Uh, after that, depending on how fast we're going and what track we're visiting, uh, it can actually be hard for us to hold our heads up just because of the G-forces. It pushes our heads into the ice, and once you lose your head, uh, bad things can happen. Yeah. And, that, and that's another factor for the seven girls that have, have already gone down, because they will then have to go back, and, and it's not just the, the head and the neck, of course, they've taken all that power out of the legs. You're, you're used to doing it a second time, but having to go and do it a third time, they're, they're going to have to go into a, a warm-up or recycling area that, in the head that they've never really done, that their body's not used to. Absolutely. I should also add, though, that it's not unheard of for an athlete to take a third run because yeah. there is a rule that states that if there's an impediment in the track or something that gets in the way of having a fair race, the athlete does have the option of taking a third run. And we saw that a couple times last year. Jane Channel from Canada, she hit a broom once that was yep. left in the track, and then she hit a twig in St. Moritz that got right under her runners. And because of that, she had the option of taking the third run and giving it another go. So it's not completely foreign to some of these athletes. No, it, it tends historically, and we had it actually in the Winter Games in 2002, one of the British bobsled drivers, Lee Johnson, was hit by a coin that was tossed into oh. by, by a kid on the side of the track. And, and again, you can see how close the crowd is to the track. Um, but reruns tend not to go, first of all, because it's so hard to mentally reset and really get back to that focus that you've spent you know, half an hour, an hour getting to, then you've got to scrabble. With a skeleton, it's not so bad. With a four-man bobster, you've got to scrabble to get the sled back to the top, get the team back and, and really to that, exactly. you know, four, zenith. Coordinating four people in a, in a bobsled mm. versus one person on the skeleton sled. That being said, though, I might make the argument that skeleton is more affected by the snow because we Definitely. weigh so much less. And Definitely. when we do hit those snow drifts, the velocity, the momentum, it can be impacted far more than you would in a 500 pound bobsled. Well, right now it is still snowing hard. And yesterday it was the light, icy, gritty stuff that you get at night here. Today, as you can see, it's settling on the, the fans even as they walk around. This is big, fat, wet snow. In the yellow jacket, you can see Axel Junk, a couple of uh, his friends, from the Austrian bobsleigh team is Christopher Grothair, our race winner. First time out last week, his first ever World Cup win. That's going to be a, a pretty special moment for any slider, don't you think? Absolutely. Not only the win, but the track record as well for Christopher. He had an amazing race toppling Martins Dukers. It was uh, phenomenal to not only watch, but to be a part of. Uh, he's, he's sliding very well, and I can't give him enough credit for that. And, and listen, you know, we, we said last week to beat Martin Stukas is a rare enough thing. I mean, in Altenburg or anywhere else. Correct. Here it's almost unheard of. But 
to beat Martis Dukos by three tenths of a second when Dukos didn't finish upside down on his back as he has, you know, as he does once every quad just to remind us that in fact he is he not is an human. automaton. Yeah, exactly. To beat him by three tenths, I mean, everybody must have looked at, at that performance from Christopher Groher and gone, Oh my lord, what a day he's having. He, uh, you looked back at the replays of that, he just had the perfect Kreisel, he carried so much speed into the lower portion of that Altenburg track. It was a joy to watch and I'm still in awe of it. Yeah, absolutely. And then, this weekend, Martins comes back yesterday. First heat, Martins and Thomas Ducours, the two brothers, two hundreds of a second apart. Everybody else, third of a second back, half a second back, whatever. And then the second heat, Martins wins not by four or five or three or four, 6,200. He blow, blows it away. He is phenomenal at this track. And I, I look at him and I, I, I just can't comprehend how he gets that much speed. Certainly he has over a decade of experience on Meso. He has the experience, he, know, he knows the subtleties of the track, and he knows how to build as much speed as possible. And it was phenomenal to watch. He, he is a fantastic slider, without he's, a doubt. He's the ghost image that you chase in video racing games, isn't exactly. he? I mean, he, he absolutely is. He's the AI that shows you the perfect way to get down. And there's not too many times you can pick very much out of his run and go, yeah, well, that was rubbish. Exactly. It's interesting. I was having a conversation with my teammate Kyle Tress just yesterday, a 2014 Olympian. He's been around for about 15 years in the sport now, and we were debating whether or not someone could build a robot that would be able to be faster than a human down the track. Mm -hmm. And we were thinking, well, I wonder if we could model it after someone or who would be the, the litmus test to test that against. And I think the answer would be Martins Dukers. It would have to be. Mm -hmm. It would have to be. I was talking yesterday after the two-man race to Francesco Friedrich. He won his third race of the season in two-man. Uh, he's only started three, even though this is round four. The uh, Germans bobsleigh team didn't do Lake Placid. It was also his third consecutive race here. And uh, he was fairly happy with that. And I said to him, OK, you've only got to win another six in a row to catch up with Martins. And he went, what? I said, yeah, he's won. Today was his ninth straight win here. And he went, so he was talking to his brakeman, and they were just going, oh, that's no. Yeah. See, in Bob, in Bob Sled, but, but even in Skeleton, I always say that Skeleton is even harder to predict. But Martins has taken that out. You know, he's become so much of a defining standard you pretty much always look to him and say okay where where's the speed in the track where what are we expecting you look at martins and go okay well that's pretty much where the benchmark is it is it is absolutely he has proven that he is human after all mm -hmm. though he did have a few struggles early on in the season he yeah. didn't make the podium in whistler for the first time in a long time and uh then he had that little flip uh, in Lake Placid, uh, right at the exit, crossing the finish line on his back with his sled on top of him uh, in those very cold and yep. hard ice conditions. Yep. And there was, uh, there was a couple of stats going around. The last time that he hadn't won for two races in a row was back in 2011. And I think the last time that he hadn't won for three races in a row, I can't remember, maybe 2006, 7, something like that. So, I mean, it was unusual in the extreme. But... He and his brother were busy, especially in North America, busy testing sleds. I think they've gone through half a dozen sleds this season. Slight variations, I mean, no, possibly nothing radical, but certainly when I talked to him in uh, Lake Placid, they were going back home to Segulda in Latvia, and they had another couple of new sleds and half a dozen sets of runners to test. So this is, he said, okay, th this season is all about trying to get it right. By the time we get to Korea, when we leave Korea, we want to know in our heads what we're going to use next year in the run-up to the Games, because next year we've got to learn how to get the best out of what we have. We're not going to start messing with it, because at some stage, testing has to stop and racing has to start, and next Precisely. year is some stage. Exactly, and, and that is typical to do a lot of testing the year before the Olympics. You want to nail out the best setups that you have, you want to throw away the ones that don't work, and yeah. you've got to dial it in the year before so that you can start executing the year of. And that may be something that actually viewers who are less familiar with Skeleton uh, might not know, is that the sleds themselves, highly tunable. You can change the stiffness on them, you can change the runners that go into the bottom, you can change how they articulate, how they take a curve, and there's a lot of adjustability, sometimes too much, enough mm. that it can drive you mad if you think about it for, <laughs> for too yeah. long. 
But if you lose the sweet spot and start verging away, then finding it again can be really tough. It absolutely can be. And also because we only do generally two to three runs a day, yeah. it's hard to test reliably, reliably and repeatedly. And uh, because of that, it's it's very easy to, to be tempted into changing too many variables at once. And you have to be disciplined about it. You have to be scientific about it. Change one variable at a time and see if you can discern a difference. I talk to race car drivers a lot about this sport during the summer. They say, hey, what are you going to do in the winter? And I tell them, and they go, wow, what's that like? And I try and explain to them just how little time you guys actually spend on a sled on ice. First of all, the season really only runs from October till March. Correct, yeah. So you don't have... You know, if you're a race car driver, you can test any day of the year, unless there's actually snow on the ground, and in Northern Europe that doesn't tend to be too much of a problem. Okay, it might be cold, it might be wet, but you can still learn something. When there's no ice, you guys don't really get a chance to learn much about sliding. And I said, okay, imagine you go to Silverstone for a race. First day of practice, you can do two laps. And they'll be three hours apart or two hours apart, quite conceivably. So it might be raining on one lap, it might be dry on the next. Then the next day of practice, you do another two laps. And then the race is a single lap followed an hour later by another single lap, and we add the times together. With constantly just, changing weather conditions. And they just yep. look at you like you're an idiot, because yeah. they'll go testing for a day, even even in a basic club racing, you know, you're paying for it yourself, you're just doing it as a hobby. If you go for a day on a track, you know, you'll, you'll spend 20 minutes practicing and 30 minutes racing, you know, you'll do 10, 15, 20 laps of a track, you'll go away actually knowing something about it. Here, like you say, your first time in on any track, you might do six runs, and come back a year later. Not next week or the next day. You can't come back for a year. It, I, I just don't understand how anybody can make scientific judgment. I mean, you know, you're an intelligent man. Tell me, how do you make a scientific judgment? Is it just best guess? With great difficulty. Yeah. That's how I would say. Uh, the legend Ryan Davenport used to say that he wanted at least 12 runs, if not 16 runs in a row before he could make a judgment. And that would mean that that testing period, the scientific testing period, would be spread out over a week or more. Yeah. And during that time, you would have constantly changing weather conditions, the variables night might not be quite the same, yep. and it's, it is a struggle. It's a little bit of personal feel, it's a little bit of your own bias perhaps, but at the end of the day, you have to make a decision. You have to choose your runner, you have to choose your sled setup, you have to choose the stiffness, and then you gotta get on the sled and race. Well, Lizzie Arnold told me when we were at the World Championships in Lake Placid that in the first three years she slid, she never once changed the setup of her sled, never once went on a different set of runners. And I just kind of looked and went, oh, that's quite unusual. She said, well, if the sled was different, how would I know what difference I was making? It's good advice. I, I would have to defer to Lizzie, certainly. She is the yeah. Olympic champion, and she does know a thing or two about sliding and about skeleton. But it's very similar to what I did the first time that I went to Europe. I was running all new tracks on Europa Cup, and I just made the decision that I'm going to keep the same setup and use one set of runners for my entire time in Europe. Because the biggest variable on the sled is me. It's, yeah. it's the person. It's the yeah. athlete. It's the stuff between the ears, so to speak, and how you navigate the sled down the ice, how you try and find those lines. So in my mind, anyway, it, it's very good advice to keep the setup as constant as possible until you're intimately familiar with a track or a setup, and then you can start tweaking things and see if you can squeeze out a little bit more speed or a little bit more time. Yeah, I'd have to say she is definitely now at the stage where she knows where she's going and she can make the adjustments she to her does. sled. But, you know, I, it's, it struck me immediately that if you're a coach, that's basically what you need to do with an athlete. For, for three seasons, okay. The only the only time you check your sled is to make sure the setup is exactly the same, and then you go and learn how to, to get the best out of yourself. Well, a little bit more conflab at the top, so the jury members have called everybody together. Surely discussing the, the current weather situation, it does look like we have an estimated start time. Mm -hmm. I should say restart time. So it'll be 110, so everybody will be starting to get themselves back and, uh, yeah, the, the snow has sort of lightened a little bit. It's still big, fat flakes of snow, and you can see the track workers are shoveling up quite a lot of it. The problem is also the wind as well. Yeah. It's not just the snowfall, but when the wind blows in and you get a bunch of snow drifts that fall into the curves, yeah. that's, that is a handful to get out. 
And of course, we're racing next week as well. So if the weather doesn't play ball and it doesn't look like we're going to get a clean race in, the other option is for them to cancel it here and carry it over maybe to Samaritz next week, to Koenigsegg the week after. They'll be on the phone to the tracks going, OK, where have we got the time? Who can give us the time? Because the tracks aren't just uh, racing, they also have guest drives and, you know, you can take a taxi bob down and all those programmes may be already in place. And so, uh, you know, one track or another may be able to accommodate another two heat race uh, to keep for up to eight World Cup races. Well, all the athletes downstairs in the warm, Alexander Tretikov in the beanie there with uh, his Russian teammates up at the top of the track and the coaches there. Uh, listening to Daniel Skleter, the head of the jury from Switzerland. That's him facing us. Martin Rettel with his back to us. The uh, Belgian and, quote, small nations, team Rettel coach, I think is the way they like to... Uh, the international conglomerate, we yeah, like to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that makes it sound more like Smirsh or something. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not an evil thing. It's a good thing. It's a good it thing. Is, yeah. There's one of the landmarks on this track, the uh, Bratwur stand down at the bottom. That's where lunch is coming from. Uh, yeah, so, OK, it looks... Thumbs up from Daniel. OK, are we in uh, an agreement here? Look at the sleds. I mean, the sleds t seem to take all different shapes and sizes. They do. We see... Uh, I see a few Bromleys there, the 13, the 15, and the 16. Those are the Bromley x 18 We've got Lizzie's uh, Blackrock sled, the number 14 sled there. But they're within a certain set of regulations. The sled has to be a certain width, a certain length, but once you have those parameters set, there is a lot of variability, and certain sled manufacturers will opt for one aerodynamic setup versus another, and the way that they incorporate their runners into the sled, and the, where they have their pivot points in the sled, and the articulation points. Uh, so there is some room for creativity and for some some adjustments, both by the athletes and by the sled manufacturers themselves. And then, of course, the critical part as well is your contact with the running surface. Now, this is like a tyre on a racing car. They are all round and black. Right. And you actually have to know what the tyre is before you have any idea of what it's doing. To me, all the runners look exactly the same. I, could, I couldn't tell yes. you, you know, what's a fact. I mean, there's, there's all these names for different grinds of runner, and I, it's just... It's just gobbledygook. It might <laughs> yes. as well be might as well be computer code to me. It's just a, an, an endless minefield of and 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 you talk about every every manufacturer will have their own method for yeah. naming a runner. Some use numerical codes. Others will use creative names. And it's sometimes a balance between the two. And there is so there again just with the sleds. There are certain parameters that uh, the runners have to. Um, abide to. They say, for instance, the, the grooves that are cut into the steel, they can only be a maximum of two millimeters deep, uh, for instance. And within that, though, then there's, a lot, again, a lot of creativity into, well, where do you want to put the cuts? How long do you want to make the cuts? Will it give you more control or will it give you less control? And it's, it's a little bit, again, to start with, a little bit of a guessing game, but eventually you narrow down to what you like and what you think performs well. And as you can see here, they're tubular steel, so it's not it a square edge Correct. because that doesn't then cut up the ice. And it's not a flat surface either. It's like grandma's rocking chair. There is a bow, as you, as you describe it, and so the, the, the bottom of the rocker, like in the rocking chair, is what touches the ice. Now, the grooves, the knives, however they're described, mm -hmm. those are... <laughs> behind the pivot points as you look they at the are. runner, aren't they? They are on the back half of the runner. So normally, if you look again at the runner, it shows you that tubular steel where the front half is just going to be round tubular steel. And then generally, the back half is where you cut the grooves or the knives into the runner, and that's what will give you grip uh, when you're riding down the ice. But as you say, they are very small ridges. I mean, you say knives, you make it sound like it's a big, sharp edge. It's not. No, but it's it, not. But you can get an awful lot of purchase on the ice and that's that'll be the weight of the knees and 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 so on that, that brings those knives into play right absolutely yep the knees press into the sled it'll push one side or the other down and as that side goes down 
it'll dig the runner into the ice, and that will just give you the little bit of extra grip that you need to execute your turns. So if you're trying to use it to make you turn better to the right, you, your right knee your goes, right down, knee goes and, down and gives you that purchase. Exactly. So to turn right, you put your right knee down, or alternatively, you can put your left shoulder into the sled, because it'll both yeah. it'll pivot the sled in the same manner. And you can even combine the two if you want, your right knee and your left shoulder if you need a really strong steer, turn the nose of the sled and get yourself through a corner cleanly. So that'll be somewhere like down in the labyrinth out of uh, the Kreisel in Koenigsegg or somewhere exactly. where you're looking for a really strong steer or, or in Altenburg. Altenburg, or, curve four, that's yeah. another one. You really have to turn the nose of that sled. And at that point, you may even need to drop a toe as yeah. well. So you put your shoulder in, you put your knee in, and you drop your toe, drag an anchor, turn the sled. Well, I kind of imagine it, 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 it's not at all like canoeing, but I kind of imagine that as you steer, if you can imagine a canoe going in a straight line, if you dip a paddle in the left, it slows that side down. Now, it's it's not right. the same effect. But it's similar. Yeah. You're right. You're, on the, you're certainly yeah. on the right path because every time you steer the sled, every time you give it that input to take a corner and make a turn, it does cut ice. It cut it cuts the ice beneath the sled and it can slow you down. So oftentimes it's about finding the balance between cutting just enough ice so that you can execute the steer, but also letting the sled run so that it has that momentum and that you don't slow yourself down. Well, the jury have come to a decision on the race. It, we are going to go for a one heat race and that will start at 1.45, which is the scheduled start time for the second heat. So that is going to be announced to the crowd. Now, as you can see, even from this shot up in the start shed, okay, we're under the roof, so it's not snowing on here, but look at the fans. There's definitely much less snow out there, much much less snow it outside lighter, of our yep. window. So we'll go for a single heat race. So everything that's gone before, uh, those seven sliders, okay, that won't count. So we'll just be going, this this will be sudden death. So it'll it be, uh, get in, get out. Um, and luckily for some of the women who may not have made the finals, they yeah. actually get a chance. Yeah. It's one run, everyone's in, and that'll be the order. Yeah. Well, I, I, I often look at the results, particularly of how people fare in the second heat. I think it'd be interesting to see how, like a World Cup season, I, one day when I'm really bored and got nothing else to do, I might just do this, take out the first run times and just use the first run to set the start order for the second heat and only have a decision on the second heat times. Oh, interesting. So somebody who gets a smoking second heat might come from 15th up to 7th, but right. actually, they might end up with the second fastest heat of the competition. If you're Usain Bolt, nobody gives you a three-tenths of a second head start because you were three-tenths ahead in the semifinals. It's a very interesting point that you bring up, and I, I do sometimes think about it in track and field terms, as that was my background through yeah. university. Yeah. And you compare it to an event, say, the long jump or the triple jump, which is what I did back in the day. And in long jump and triple jump, it's about just putting down your very best jump. Yep. You'll get three attempts. If you scratch the first one, gets thrown out. Scratch the second one, can be thrown out. As long as you nail that third one, you can make your way to the finals and you're good to go. That's not the case here in Skeleton. It's two runs and you aggregate those two runs yeah. and it's, it's about consistency. It's much more about consistency than, say, a lot of your track and field events. And historically, I imagine, when all tracks were like Samaritz, open, made of ice and snow and not with artificial cooling, like this track here does, it would have been to take account of the fact of the very changeable track conditions, yes. the weather and so on. And I do think that still plays a role even yeah. in today's world, even with these artificially refrigerated tracks. Because oftentimes, if the weather's warm and it's above freezing in terms of ambient temperature, the track will slow down quite yep. rapidly. And so it's good to have that second heat where you reverse the order, give everyone the second run, and it evens the playing field. And that's that's what it's designed yep. to do. Yep. Not only the consistency, but also to give every racer an equal opportunity to slide their best. Exactly so. Although we have got a start time for our second heat, we have now got uh, you know, about an hour or so, just under an hour to go. So we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you very much indeed uh, for saving my bacon, Nathan. And uh, we we'll look forward to a one heat wonder in the second heat. The weather has definitely passed through a little bit. Let's hope that it stays fair 
to get our second heat underway. Start time, will the first lead on ice will be 13.49 local. We'll be up at 13.45 to start our show. 12.45 GMT, so wherever you are, if you're up early, East Coast, West Coast, thank you for that. Have some coffee, get a snooze, reset the alarm for the second heat. We will be back wherever you are. So join us for the second heat or the only heat of the women's skeleton world cup and the european championships will be hopefully decided on that in the meantime from nathan from me martin haven we will be back again at 13:45 local time we'll see you then
es ja mehrmals schon mitbekommen heute. Wir stellen alles auf Randbank mit einem einzigen Rennlauf, das heute entschieden wäre Europa.
truck. I think, I think. At the beginning, at the beginning, the plan was like this. So, the plan. 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 The Entweder auf die Tribüne für den dritten Platz, die Wipptickets für den ersten Platz und für den zweiten Platz gibt es von der BMW gesponsert. Natürlich die Wipptickets für die nächste Veranstaltung hier im Herbst oder im Frühjahr nächstes Jahr zum nächsten BMW IBSF World Cup im Bob und Skelet hier in der Feld ins Eisarena. Hello and welcome to Winterberg in Germany. We're in the Hochsauerland, ready for race four of the Women's Skeleton World Cup in the BMW World Cup Series. Hello everybody, welcome back to Winterberg where we are ready for the first and only heat of this race with the European Championships. I'm Martin Haven, alongside me, US slider Nathan Crumpton. Nathan, this Winterberg track, we've just had the first heat snowed off, should be clear for the second. Where are we looking for the girls to make their speed? They have to make a lot of speed right at the start. It was unfortunately snow affected in the first heat. Hopefully it'll be clear for the second heat. The ladies want to get as much speed as possible before they enter this kink known as Curve Zero, which is arguably one of the trickiest parts of the track. If they make a mistake there, it's going to be compounded right here going into Curve 2, into the Omega. Uh, anytime you're going uphill, if you make a mistake, it's just going to bleed time out very rapidly. And then again, going from 3 to 4 right here, it also goes uphill. So you're going to be in triple trouble if that's the case. Here you can start building some speed again as you set yourself up into the Kreisel, which is right here, a 270-degree curve. You'll have three oscillations. You'll be coming off 
hopefully with some good speed, into curve eight, which sets you up for curve nine. Curve nine sets up the entire bottom of the track. You want to skip curve 10 completely as you go into this double oscillation, curve 11. Then you enter the lower labyrinth, where you're trying to build your top speed, which will be right there before you finish up curve 14, the zeal curve here. And you want to avoid that little flip right on the exit as you cross the finish line. And the ice with the snow on it in the first heat really was very slow indeed. We won't see the sort of speeds that we saw in the World Championships two years ago when the track record was set. But hopefully uh, conditions will be good. Crowd still here, big crowd here. And they were all like snowmen earlier on. Everybody ready to go. For those of you that missed it, the first heat did start. We had seven athletes go down the ice, but then it was clear that we were not in any kind of position to have a race. There's your Olympic champion, Lizzie L Lizzie. Lizzie Yarnold, the uh, European champion two years ago. Tina Herrmann, who is the last woman to win on this track. And in fact, she was the first German winner since 2009 when Kirsten Simkoviak won. So although it's a German track and the bobsleigh teams often fare well here, it's quite an open race. How important is the start to a slide on this track? It is critical. This is known as a starter's track. The only caveat to that is that little kink. It's curve zero, the one that was added 29 years later after the original track was built. You do have to have that fast start, but you also have to get through curve zero cleanly. And we saw a couple guys who had some great starts yesterday, but they scrubbed too much speed there. As long as they can carry it through curve zero, they'll be set up pretty well. Here is our start list. We have 24 athletes in the field. There is no cut. There will be no second heat. The first heat was uh, eradicated, so it is just a uh, single run for the European Championship medals and for the World Cup points. So wherever you finish, you don't get a chance to improve. You can see snow blowing up into the face of Joska Lecomte, the first of our athletes. It's blowing up the track. Grooves do look much clearer than they were in the first heat, so that's something the jury have made a big point of. 560 for Yasuka off of the start, getting through relatively cleanly there. Entering curve one, trying to carry that velocity as much as possible, 60.4 kilometers an hour as she enters the omega curve and into curve three. Indication of how much better conditions are, that's 11 hundredths of a second faster than her push at the beginning of the cancelled first heat. And much closer to the normal times that we're used to seeing these ladies get through with. Here she enters the Kreisel, this critical portion of the track, which can be a make-or-break portion. And looks like Yasuke is getting through relatively cleanly, a light toe correction, her leg coming out, trying not to hit before curve nine. Squeaks in, nice early entry into 11 as she sets herself up for the lower labyrinth here. Trying not to flop too much off of the corners, a little bit out of control, 124.5 kilometers an hour. And we'll see how she got, avoids the blip at the end. 59.19 for her rerun. Now her first heat was probably the best weather conditions of anybody. She came down 59.22, so pretty much the same. But then there was, she came onto a freshly swept track. She did. And certainly as the run progressed, the snow was getting heavier, thicker and wetter. So for Joska, two very similar runs. Here she goes, entering, looks, like Kreisel there as she waves just a little bit. You want you don't want to wave too much, but at the same time, you can't have it completely flat. There's a, f a delicate balance that each slider has to find as they navigate through the Kreisel. Second of our starters in this one heat wonder is Yulia Kanakina from Russia, a second season slider at the World Cup level. Only been on ice four or five years. And while so many athletes are stolen from track and field by Athlon, Heptathlon, uh, she has been stolen from the ballet bar. She has, and she posts a 5.38. That is, if I recall, almost half a second. Yes, half a second faster than her first run, which really goes to show how much the snow, how much it affected that first heat. So this is much more of the times that we're used to seeing from Yulia. She is a fantastic starter. She does have some of the fastest start times in the field, and that should serve her well as we see the green numbers as she makes her way down through the track. Here she is, uh, <coughs> setting herself up for Kreisel, right at about the 90 kilometer an hour mark. Comes out cleanly, holding some really nice lines, looking relaxed on the sled, and avoids that little tap before curve nine. Gaps come right down, just nine hundredths of a second in front of Joska Leconte from 2,900 up. 
We'll see if she can hold on to that. And it just switches to the red as she falls behind by one hundredth of a second. Doesn't have quite the speed, so it might drift away a little bit more down to nine hundredths of a second. 59.28. She did a 60.18 in the first heat, so her start was half a second quicker. Her run was only nine tenths quicker than her previous run, but again, she was the second starter. There was a little more snow for her, clearly a lot more at the start. Julia, she's got to be happy with that at least. Uh, at least to have a, a clean groove, a faster start, and putting down a run that she knows she's capable of. She's loading onto her sled. She gets a smooth load. She's had some troubles here loading in the past. Uh, I believe it was Junior World Championships where she popped the groove, but she navigated that quite nicely. Getting through that curve zero, a little bit of a skid on the exit of curve zero, but she makes the correction and gets through without hitting the wall at least. Kim Marmans from Belgium is our third starter. Now, she was leading when the race was called, so probably the only coach that wasn't 100% in favour was the man shouting there at the top of the track, Martin Rettel. But in the end, the jury made absolutely the right call, Nathan. There was nowhere else they could have gone with that heat. Absolutely. It was snowing far too hard, and the race was not even remotely close to being fair at the start. And they did make the right decision in making it a one-heat race. As we see Kim coming here through this little uphill portion from curve three into four, and then starting to build some speed again now as she enters into the five, six, seven combination. Coming through cleanly, riding her uh, Willy Schneider sled. She's looking very smooth and relaxed. Nice line through Kreisel, using a little bit of her toe to get through there. Keeping the height away, just brushes the entry into nine, but not gonna affect her too much. Gets a lovely entry into curve 11 there and then try and build as much speed as possible. As she goes into the green, 300s ahead, we should see some good speed here, 125.6. And this should see Kim pop into the lead, as she does by 1200ths of a second. Again, her first heat actually was uh, 58.81. She got a bit of a break in the weather. That's a 59.07 off a faster start. This, again, the battle of the Low Countries. This is the closest track to Holland and Belgium, so Kim Marmans and Jos Lecomte first and second for Belgium and the Netherlands. Kim's coming through the lower labyrinth here, looking nice and smooth onto the sled. You try not to get hung up and have as smooth of a transition as possible. She just brushes the wall, but luckily that's right where the finish line is, and she, she gets away without flipping the sled, luckily. Chin right down there as she crosses the line. Kendall Wessenberg from the USA, the fourth of our starters. And Kendall, a 6.51 start in the first heat. She could do that in any other day with her shoelaces tied together. She could probably do that left-handed. Hopefully she'll get a, a much better start here. Little bit of a rough load onto the sled, but it gets kicked out of the groove nice and straight. 567. It's nearly a second faster. And then much closer to her to her normal times. And that's good to see a, a better start for Kendall here. And hopefully she uses it to build as much speed as possible. She is a very talented driver. She has a good feel for the sled and for the ice. She's got her head low in a, a nice aerodynamic position. And she's going to be trying to build as much momentum as possible as she still stays in the green and has an 11 hundredths of a second lead. 91.3 kilometers an hour. I believe that's the fastest speed that we've seen so far coming into Kreisel as she sets herself up for nine. Beautiful entry into nine. Nowhere near that slider's right wall. And she's setting herself up for the lower labyrinth. Hopefully she builds some more speed. Good exit off of each of these labyrinth curves. 126 kilometers an hour, still building more speed. This is a great looking run for Kendall as she crosses the line with nearly a quarter second in the bank. And very nearly two seconds quicker than the snow affected first run that she did. 58.84 puts her in the lead by a quarter of a second. 78.3 miles an hour into the finish corner. That's the top speed so far. Quite quick enough with your chin almost dragging the ice. And uh, you really get the feeling of speed from this running position. You got a great shot there of the runner as it's, you only have one runner in the groove, unlike bobsled, which has both of their runners in the grooves. The skeleton athlete gets to pick either the left or the right groove to push in. As you see Kendall there choosing to use the slider's left groove, the viewer's right groove, and gets a nice load onto their sled and navigates her way to apparently the top spot in the field.
So she will go into the leader's box. Next up, Jane Channel of the USA. And again, another big starter who looked like she was hobbling away from the blocks in the wind and the snow of our aborted first run. Jane really is a fantastic starter. She's so explosive off of the blocks. Very powerful athlete. Hopefully we'll see a good time from here. Might be one of the fastest ones that we see all day. Look at her turnover as she loads under the sled. Gets in smoothly, slight correction out of the groove, and a 5.35, that is an excellent start. Using that left toe very liberally as she goes into curve one, trying to stay off that wall as much as possible. If you hit that wall before you go into curve one, your run is almost over, and so she does a really good job of making that correction. How much Whoa, a little bit of a drift there. Bowen going late and a skin and a hit. Oh, you hate to see that, especially at the uphill portion of the track. This could spell trouble for Jane here. Uh, hopefully she's built enough of a lead that she can get away relatively unscathed, but she's not going to be happy with herself after, uh, after that little mishap. 4,500s down to 1,300s. Mm, as she, she's, uh, she might be running out of track here, I don't know. She's trying to keep it smooth, six hundredths of a second. Decent lower portion of the track, but oh, when you have a hit and a skid like that up at the top, it's going to hurt. Oh, she falls behind by two hundredths of a second as Kendall maintains the lead. 58.86, very close to the bottom. But she was one mile or half a mile an hour slower into the final corner. And on the flatter sections of the track, it really costs you if you make a mistake, right? It hurts you twice, because you not only make the mistake, but you do it as you're going uphill. Right there, curve three into four is going uphill. She enters really late, gets too much height into curve four, comes out with a skid and a hit onto the wall, and that just did her in, unfortunately. And there you see the little flop off of the finish curve that so many athletes will have. And uh, luckily, the finish line is right there, and it shouldn't affect your time too much. Five sleds down, and the leader is Kendall Wessenberg of the USA. A single heat race. There are no lets, no buys. Next up, Laura Dees, whose fiance Richard is here watching the action this weekend. Laura, another explosive starter. We should hopefully see something in the 530 range. And there it is, 538. A much better start for Laura. And a good curve zero, too. Slight little toe corrections. Make sure she's on the right line. But good velocity, over 61 kilometers an hour. That's great velocity that she can hopefully carry through the rest of the track. And she's got a big lead right now. Four tenths of a second for Lady Laura, as her teammates affectionately call her. Friends down at the back, at the bottom of the track, and family with a D's rhymes with P's banner. Yep, she's got her fan club out here. They came in, and hopefully Laura can do them proud with a good result here. Nice exit off of Kreis. That, that little flap is actually OK, as long as you maintain parallel runners. Coming off of curve 9, gets a nice early entry into 11. Controls the oscillations well there, and now the rhythm section of the track. Just being smooth, maintaining your velocity. Still has a quarter of a second in the bank. Lost a little bit of her momentum, and takes a little bit of a flip, but still two, two tenths of a second into the lead. I think we heard the family. There we go. There's her fan club right there, cheering her on. <laughs> and Laura's pumped about that. She yep. is happy. Good looking run. 4,200s up at the Chrysler came. Uh, half of that disappeared on the way down to the finish line, but still 2,100s in front. And her start, 538. The snowy first start, 6.02 seconds. A world of difference between <laughs> the first heat and the clear track that we have now. Yeah. Great load. She's a fantastic starter. She gets that final step nice and close to the sled. Nice dive, very smooth. No chance of popping the groove with a load like that. And gets the little flip on the exit, a little uh, leader's box flip, so to speak. Yep, hanging it out for speed. And a fan step, the first of our German athletes. First World Cup season for this young Bavarian. We head her to her home track in a couple of weeks in Koenigsegg. I think she'll be a lot happier when she's back home in Koenigsegg. She does not have one of the strongest starts. Getting very close to that slider's right wall in the exit of curve zero. Doesn't have quite the velocity at the start that we've seen some of the other ladies with here. But she is an excellent driver. She's got some great equipment, and hopefully she can make up some ground as she makes her way down the track here. Turn 20 in November. So still very much the junior in the German team, which is all young. It's all young and it's very deep too. They've got a lot of depth. They've got an excellent program in Germany. All excellent sliders. You'll note that they have great aerodynamic form. 
Their feet rarely come out to make the corrections. It's all under control. And this is some very smooth sliding by Anna, which we would expect from her. And see if she's closing the gap a little bit. Great speed, 127.5 kilometers an hour. That's fantastic velocity off the finish as she goes into second place. That's a full mile an hour quicker than anybody else has produced at the bottom. That is big speed at the bottom of this track, and that's what the Germans have always been able to find. She goes into joint second with Kendall Wessenberg, Laura Dees of Great Britain, still the leader. First seven of our 24 sleds down. Well, Van Stett, just 20 years old. This is the bit that needs most improvement in her game, probably. It does. The 585 start, it's not quite keeping pace with the rest of the field. And she loads really early and has a very wide final step. If you remember Laura's from one slider before, her final step was much closer to the sled and much more biomechanically efficient. Uh, if Anna could take it a little bit deeper and work on her form a little bit, she'll be able to gain a little bit of time back there at the start. And that will come with age and practice. Next up, the last German woman to win on this track. Tina Herman won the race here last year. Previous German winner was before the Whistler Games. Tina's a fantastic slider. Gets a 554 start and navigates curve zero quite well, staying a good bit away from the slider's right wall. Entering the omega curve. Can be a tricky curve. It does enter uphill, so you're trying to preserve as much momentum as possible. And it goes downhill back into this little uphill section into curve four. Gets a little bit of height and does take the tap before she enters curve five. 2200s back, but now she starts to turn it around. The gap to Laura Dees, the leader, down to 1900s. Tina is one of those speed merchants. She does find a lot of speed at the bottom of the track, and she'll be trying to reel in Laura. Down to 500s of a second. She has his home track advantage right here as we see Tina go right into the green, building more and more speed, driving some beautiful lines, and we should see her take the lead at the finish here. Tina Herman really turns it around below the Chrysler. That's Order where the second comes. Unbelievable. Don't forget, she was 22 hundreds behind at corner four, and she comes in front by 26 hundreds. Wow. 79 miles per hour on that. Getting quite close to that 80 mile per hour benchmark. Yeah. So impressive run from Tina Herman. Here she is going from four or five. She Gets a little bit too much height in four and then takes that tap before five. But she makes a good correction. She doesn't let the mistake snowball and uh, was able to find some fantastic speed at the bottom. Our reigning world champion and last year's European silver medalist, his last year's European gold medalist. In fact, Jan Janine Flock has won two European golds in the last three seasons. In the last four years, she has not been out of the medals. She's boosted herself up to equal third in the all-time European medals for women's skeleton. Janine, she has fantastic form on the sled. She is a great slider. She upgraded her sled. She was using the Bromley V14 last year, which she won plenty of medals on, and then she just changed to the Bromley X18 for this season. And she actually has a unique runner choice. Uh, one of her sponsors, Rathberger, they've designed a, their own cuts for Jane. And she won a gold medal in that Placid, and she'll be looking for some more hardware here today. She's really in the peak of her career now, isn't it? She last two or three seasons, she's been in medal contention every track. She struggled with injury early on in the season, but I think she's coming back from that, and her sliding is really carrying her through as she's already in the green numbers. A mistake-free run so far as she enters Kreisel, driving some beautiful lines, get a little bit of height there, and perfect entry into the 8-9 combination. Stays off of the wall going into 9, which is critical. 96.5 kilometers an hour. That's great speed as she enters curve 11 and the lower labyrinth here. You can see her steering the sled off of each corner, trying not to get hung up as she's a tenth of a second in the lead, 127.1. Fantastic building, speed. Building a lead over last year's winner, Tina Herman. That's an impressive run. No wonder coach Mickey Grunberger is happy with that. She has not had a World Cup medal on this track. That's a fantastic finish for Janine. Dare I say a flawless run. I, I would be hard pressed to find any errors in that run. That is a textbook slide down this Winterberg track. Great run from Janine. Gets on to curve zero nice and early. Redirects it without breaking it into a skid. Just a tiny bit of a toe correction there. Make sure those runners are parallel and down she goes. 
There's Tina Herman, big smile on her face, but Janine Flock takes the lead from Tina Herman. And next up is the hometown queen, Jacko. This is Jacqueline Lurling, first emerged in the World Championships two years ago, came in as the junior world champion on her home ice and was only beaten by the reigning Olympic champion. Silver medal two years ago, silver medal last year. Can she go one better? We'll find out here. Jacqueline's another one of the ladies who struggles a little bit at the start, a 572. Not the best time, but she's a fantastic driver and she should be able to navigate her sled down the track, building speed with every curve down the track. Yellow vest means she's our World Cup points leader, runner up in last year's World Cup campaign to Tina Herman, her teammate. I see a bunch of snow blowing there into the track. Hopefully that doesn't slow her down too much. She's driving some nice lines here. Gets the six to seven transition. Curve seven is the Kreisa. Drives a beautiful line through the Kreisa, keeping her feet nice and tight together. Top speed into the Kreisa, 57.6 miles an hour. Top speed here as well. 97.2, only a hundredth of a second back. And she goes into the green, into the lead. And hopefully she'll build on that as she comes through the lower labyrinth. Seven hundredths, hundredths of a second. Winner last time out in Altenburg. Top speed in the final corner. 58-12, track record is 57-42. She's nowhere near that, but she takes the lead from Tina Herman, last year's winner, and Janine Flock, the reigning European champion. Jacqueline Lerling moves into the lead. Hitting 80 miles per hour on the nose. That's the fastest speed that we've seen so far. Impeccable driving by Jacka here. And listen to the fans here. They really love their sliders on this track. They had a big thank you ceremony yesterday for one of their retired athletes. Here she is going uphill through that slightly snowy section from curve three into curve four. Maintains her position as she tries not to slip <laughs> on her way down to the exit ramp. <laughs> Well, listen, I think I don't bounce at my age. She doesn't think she's going to yeah. bounce on there either. So next up, Lelda Prejelena of Latvia. Lelda working with the Duker's brothers quite closely. She rides a Duker sled made in Latvia. She's got a decent start, 5.53, as she tries to navigate her way through that tricky, tricky curve zero. Here's some decent speed through curve one into the uphill Omega, curve two. And she's going to be looking to build some speed down the track as well. She's got 18 hundredths of a second in the bank. We'll see how much speed she can carry into the lower portion, because that's really where Jacqueline Lowell shined, was that lower bit. Really starting to make progress in the last couple of seasons. She's now a medal contender. She's been in top 10 every race this season. Just drops behind Lurling. Here she comes into the middle to lower portion of the track, which is where Jacqueline puts on her speed. But She's having a nice ride. There's nothing that I can really pick out that sh shows any errors or any flaws in her sliding. She's got some nice lines, but she's not quite carrying the speed. Maybe it's a slight setup. Maybe it's a runner choice. Well, when you don't see an error, like in a racing car, and yet the speed is just dropping away, you immediately look at the tire, or in this case, the runner, as just not being right for the ice. That would be the first thing to look at, would be the runner choice or perhaps the sled setup. Uh, unfortunately for Lelda, she does drop a few positions. Um, but overall, not a bad slide. No, no big errors in the run, and uh, sometimes it's a mystery. Sometimes one plus one equals three. Here we go. We have her start. She is a good starter. She gets that loading step nice and close to the sled. Loads knee first, nice and balanced, very smooth, and gets tucked into her position and then just has to relax as much as possible. Jacqueline Lerling, our race leader, with the first 11 sleds down in our race of one heat. We've got 24 sleds, so we still have 13 to come, but Lerling has the lead. Hurry up offense here to try and make sure we get this race done in the time that we have. And next up is Annie O'Shea of the USA. Annie here, she is now on her protostar sled. She's also been doing the back and forth that Kendall Wessenberg has been doing. 549 start, that's a solid start for Annie. Uh, getting away without hitting into curve one. Trying to carry as much of that momentum through the Omega Curve and then into this, again, uphill portion of the track, which can really kill your time if you make a mistake. But luckily, that was nice and clean for Annie. She enters here into one of the speedier portions of the track in terms of uh, gaining momentum. Makes a slight toe correction as she comes into Kreisel. Has a few waves. 
but exits cleanly, gets in nice and early into eight, which is what you want to try and avoid that hit before nine. Maintaining her speed as much as possible. It is a nice, tidy run. She looks relaxed. You can see her on the sled. She's moving with the curves as much as possible, trying not to get hung up here. Uh, maybe a little bit of a skid there, scrub some speed, 124.6 top speed, and a finish in 58.96 seconds. Well, that's a, a disappointing slide, I think, for the Americans, because Annie O'Shea started strongly. She, it bled away at the yeah. bottom of the track for her, perhaps a sled set up. Uh, one or two minor errors, but I, I don't think Annie's going to be too pleased with that finish. No. She lost a full second from start to finish on this 1,300-meter track to Jacqueline Lurling. 2,300s up to 8,400s back. It's, sometimes it's a mystery. You can lose speed, and it's hard to pinpoint where it is. Is it you? Is it the sled setup? Is it the runner choice? And she is, uh, she carries a little bit of a, a skid into the finish curve there, which scrubs some speed, but uh, any might wish that she could have that one back. Well, single shot race. And in fact, she caught me rather by surprise because she wasn't on our start list at all. So we have 25 sleds, in fact, because this is next Mimi Ravena of Canada. Mimi is an explosive starter. She set the start record in Whistler, one of her home tracks. We'll be looking for one of the top start times here as she loads onto her sled. And we just see a little bit of snow starting to come down now. 5.38, another great start as she makes that quick, almost aggressive toe tap to correct coming out of curve zero. Well, first learn about Mirella before we even saw in the World Cup because we get to tracks in North America and she was the start record holder, so exactly. I knew her name before I even saw her face. You know, she's a fantastic athlete and her sliding is coming along really well. Their coach in Canada, even she's, he's done a fantastic job. All three of his uh, female athletes have won World Cup medals in the past. Biggest lead at the Kreisel over Jacqueline Learning so far, 4,200s. How close will this get? Down to mm, about a quarter of a second there. We'll see if the track is short enough for Mimi to hold on to the lead or if Jacqueline will uh, continue to hold that leader's box spot. Ooh, this is going to be tight. 126. She may have the lead over Jacqueline Lerner. Oh, oh two hundredths of a second. Oh, that is some tight racing right there. Wow, two hundredths behind the hometown queen. That is one hell of a ride for Mirella Raniva. She's, she's still going to be happy with that. Mimi's a gal who always has a smile on her face, is always happy, and is just joy to, overjoyed to be here racing in the World Cup. And to have a strong finish like that, uh, I'm sure she'll be happy. It just gets a little bit away from her. She hangs on to that lower labyrinth corner just a little bit too long, loses a little bit of time to Jacqueline, but I, overall, she's going to be thrilled. <laughs> the Latvian fans are loving her as well. <laughs> Yeah, red and white. Yeah, that's close enough for us. <laughs> Look yeah, at us jumping for joy. Bouncing around like a spring chicken. Okay. Next up then is our reigning Olympic champion. After a year away, Lizzie Yarnell has returned. The reigning uh, 2015 Yay! European Yay! champion, rather, and 2014 world champion. Lizzie is back, and she is hungry for medals. 5.53 start, a good start for Lizzie. Oh, she just takes that little tap and gets pushed late into curve one. We'll see if she can uh, make up some of that speed. She is one of the taller girls on the tour, and she will be carrying a lot of momentum into the bottom of this track. And she's an excellent driver as well, much like Jacqueline Lowland. 1900s up on Jacqueline Lurling as she gets to the Chrysler. Going through curve six, the setup curve to the Chrysler as she enters Ooh. this big 270 degree corner. Seven hundredths of a second, the gap is down. She's behind Lurling. Can she find anything? She took a tap right there. It was a, a light one, but it threw off her entry into curve nine. That's going to hurt her a little bit more. Exits out of 11, 12, 13, and just bleeding some time here. Well, she's won her last two races here. Didn't compete last year in the World Cup. And she comes down in fifth position. Just in front of her teammate, Laura. So Jacqueline Lurling still leads by 200s from Mimi Raniva. Janine Flock lies third at the moment. It is Lurling gold, Janine Flock silver, Tina Herman bronze in the European Championships. Well, Lizzie's father Clive and mother Judith are down here as well. First time at a track for them in 18 months. Oh, she actually stepped on the sled. Ooh. Her left foot actually clipped the sled on her penultimate step. 
And that, oh, that has got to have cost her some time right there at the start. Uh, luckily, she didn't trip on the sled. We've seen that before in some unfortunate cases. But she gets away. She just takes this little tap out of curve zero, throws her line off, and uh, that probably hurt her momentum as well. 550, not a Lizzie Arnold start. Next up, the other Lizzie, Lizzie Vache. And her Bromley coaches say that she should have a great medal shot here. She should. I'm very interested in seeing this run. Lizzie, she had some runs in training that were top of the field in first place, and then she had others that were outside of the top 10. So I'm not sure what we're going to get here today, but I know Lizzie's going to be in the medal hunt for sure. Bronze in the World Championships on this track two years ago. Didn't get into the medals last year, but teammate Jane Channel did. Canadian, they do have a deep program, as I mentioned. All three of their ladies have won a medal in the World Cup now. Uh, Lizzie's an excellent driver. She's gotten very in tune with her Bromley equipment. She's got great aerodynamic positioning on her sled. As she makes her way into the Chrysler, which has made her broken a few ladies' uh, trips down the ice. She's got a, the waves, the oscillations that we see as the sled goes up and down were, were quite large there for Liz, but maybe she's going to make that work to her advantage. Quarter of a second in the lead. Good velocity as she enters the lower portion of the track here into the labyrinth. Oh, takes a little bit of a skid into 12. Going to scrub some some time as well. She's still got two tenths in the bank. Will she have enough as she skids across the line into first place by a tenth of a second? Canada has not been off the podium on this track in a decade, including wins for Amy Goff most recently and Michelle Kelly back in 2007, 2008. But uh, Elizabeth Varche, she bronze, is pumped. And she... now the leader. <laughs> her mom, Rita, I'm sure, is watching back at home. Oh, mom, Rita's waiting. here somewhere. I think she. this is her first. I haven't seen her, but Lizzie said she was coming. Again, the mummy. There oh, she there is. she is. She makes her appearance. Well, we saw what the win in Whistler meant to her. The race is not over. But maybe it is. Elizabeth Archie leads from Jacqueline Learning. Canada 1-3 okay. in Winterberg. I guess the Canadians know the shortcuts on this track. They're doing phenomenally well. And the snow is returning. Let's see if we can get this underway. European Championship bronze medalist last year, Marina Giladoni of Switzerland. Marina has a great start here. We should see one of the top start times if this snow stays out of the grooves. 5.53, a little bit slower than I would have guessed, but not bad at all. She makes those toe taps going into curve one, keep off of that wall. You'd expect it to be in the 30s along with Kanakina and Laura Dees, not Absolutely. in the 50s. Yep, that is slower than we would normally expect from Marina, but we'll see if she can drive her way back into contention here. Nearly four tenths back, that is a long way to come. It is, she's got her work cut out for her. She's got to drive some smooth lines here. Oh, she makes a couple little toe corrections. Didn't like her entry into the Chrysler. Drives it pretty smoothly, though, as she enters curve eight and tries to stay off the sliders right away. Nice, clean entry into nine. Tries to build some speed in here. Get an early entry into 11, which is nice, as long as you don't get knocked away. Into the lower labyrinth, where she'll be hitting her top speed. Oh, takes a skid, 124.3. It's not there, not there for Marina today. Horrible, horrible run for Marina Giladoni. 1.4 seconds back from our leader, Elizabeth Arce. And Elizabeth, very happy indeed at the moment. However, that is 16th of our 24 sliders. We've got eight to come, and it is snowing properly now. Doesn't look like it down at the bottom so much, but out of our window, there is more snow coming. And she was two tenths off where she should have been at the start. She was, and I don't know if she's injured. I don't know if she just had a bad start. There you can see a skid coming off of one of the lower labyrinth corners and a skid going into the finish corner as well. Maybe her setup was a little bit too aggressive, but she was scrubbing speed off of each of those corners, and uh, you could see it, it hurt her in her finish time. Yeah, not much good to say about that run at all, I'm afraid. Next up from the Netherlands, Kimberly Boss. Kimberly, the young slider in the team. She is. She does have a, a fantastic start, though, and she should be competitive here as long as the snow stays out of her way. We'll see what kind of a time Kim can put down. 13th last week in Altenburg, Germany. Let's see if she can bust back into the top 10 spots. 5.49 takes an abrupt entry into curve zero. We'll see how that holds up. Uh, she considers Eagles her home track, and there are a lot of parallels between the Winterberg track and the Eagles track, so hopefully that will carry over through to her run today.
Only four hundreds off the lead. She started just a hundred slower than our leader, Elizabeth Varche, but can she find the speed lower down? She's got an uphill battle, so to speak. She's drifting away already, 12 hundredths out of the lead as she enters into Kreisel. Is she another Bromley slider? She is, yes. Yeah. She is on a Bromley sled. Oh, she takes that big hit before curve nine, though. That is not going to do her any favors. No, I'm afraid this is going to be a little bit for her, like Marina Giardoni. Too many mistakes. You can see where the speed is going yep. away. They're adding up, and I bet Kim crosses the finish line and wish she could have this run again. Yep. No makeups here. This is a one heat race. 58 58, seventh place, nevertheless. Elizabeth Varche leading. Marina Raniva in third place. So at the moment, for Kimberly Boss, fifth in the European Championships, because we take the non Europeans out of the reckoning. So we're in the Dutch Alps, the Belgian Highlands, whatever you like to call it, and, oh, and she's, she's happy. Pumped. She is happy with that. She will take it. Yeah. Now, is this going to be her top first top ten finish in World Cup racing? I might have to check that on last year's results as well. I think well. she did have a top ten in World Championships at Eagles last year. I believe she was in eighth place, which may have been her highest finish. And again, that was what she considers uh, her home track. Mm -hmm. As we see uh, Maria Orlova at the start line here for Russia. Kimberly Boss making her World Cup debut this season, so that is her best World Cup result to date. Maria Orlova, so pleased to be back on ice and racing again this weekend. Just couldn't stop smiling after training. Now, can she get a drive that gives her a big grin as well? Oh, you get a great shot there of the snow. It is really coming down. You look at the grooves. The grooves were filled with snow there. 5.69, I've got to say, that's got to be a, a snow-affected start time. Maria is normally a, a good bit quicker off the starting block than that. Yeah. Here she is navigating the Omega Curve, looking nice and tidy, but unfortunately, she I don't think she had the momentum at the start to really bring it through. Uh, oh, just takes that little tap right there before Curve 5, has to steer really hard to make the correction there, and already bleeding away, over a second behind the pace. Yeah, having that mistake early on, and, and especially if you don't get out of the blocks quickly like any other sprint, you know, if you're two steps behind Usain Bolt, you just watch him go away, right? Exactly, yep. Takes a oh, little bit high on the end of curve nine there. Uh, might be just oh, and an abrupt entry into the labyrinth. It's kind of falling apart for Maria, unfortunately, as she uh, enters the finish curve here, and I don't know if she'll be too happy with this. Drops into 18th place, two seconds behind. Yeah, 60.07. Those are the sort of runs that we were getting in the snowy first heat. And that's uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure I've seen many looser runs from Maria Oliver. That was just disappointing. A slow start, gave her very little chance. Slow start and, and maybe just mentally it, it took her out of it. Uh, there you get a good shot of her Willy Schneider made sled, a German made sled. But boy, as soon as she gets past that 15 meter eye, the snow is coming down. Winner in Altenburg 12 months ago. Uh, first and so far only World Cup victory. But that snow in the groove, you saw her as soon as she came out from under the roof, basically the thing just slowed down even though she was still pushing it. Jacqueline Narricott of Australia next up. Uh, 19th slider. Let's see what she can produce. Jackie also unfortunately getting the snowfall groove. And she'll be having a start with a 6.05. Oh, you just hate to see that. She is a faster athlete than that for sure. Uh, and only 57.9 kilometers an hour. Uh, it's not the type of velocity that you want to see. All these ladies are faster at the start, typically. Well, we uh, now have two races going on, don't we? One where the yeah. track was clean, and the last two or three where it wasn't. Absolutely. Jackie here already a second behind the pace. You hate to see that. She's just got to do as best as she can with the conditions and try and get as much speed back as possible. Elizabeth Archie, our leader, was only five sleds ago, but she got in before the snow really arrived, and it's especially the start where it seems to be having the most effect. And it really is, because that is the only part of the track that is not covered. It's from the 15-meter point to the entry of Curve Zero. That is the only part on the track that is not covered. Down through the bottom, 123.7, 76.9. Elizabeth Archie was going 80 miles an hour. And that's why Jacqueline Narricott is yeah, a long way back, two place. and a half seconds no. behind. She shakes her head. She's disappointed. 
There's not much she can do, unfortunately. Well, the jury really had no choice in the first heat because the snow came so hard so early, but now they're in a really tough predicament because it's no longer a race. Now Correct. it's, it's just not the same for every athlete now. It's a non-starter. Anybody now has no chance whatsoever. And it's unfortunate. You hate to see this. The, the ladies have had such bad luck this entire year. All four races have been weather affected, and uh, they're just getting the short end of the stick. And nobody is going to okay. wish Lizzie, uh, Lizzie Varche not to win a race. However, you know, for the remaining half dozen athletes, you almost may as well not bother pushing at the start yeah. because you're going to get no speed now. It's a tough call, absolutely. As we see uh, Nozomi from Japan. Get off to her start. She won uh, the Japanese national champion. Oh no! She has slips a slip. On the snow. She slips on the snow. Oh, you hate to see that. Oh, poor Nozomi. 6:45. That's got to be the slowest start, and oh, she's going to be rattled for that. And the other thing we noticed at the start here, and we'll see it in the start replay, is how white the start grooves are. They are full they are of fresh snow, with snow, and oh. it is just like trying to push through sand. Two seconds behind already. Oh, this is going to be uh, such a tough run for her. But there's nothing you can do. Once you're on a skeleton sled, you are committed. There are no brakes on it. You can't just abandon the run. You're on the sled, and you have to navigate the entire rest of the track down, and you have that lingering thought in the back of your And head. the other thing is, you know, we're making a big deal about how she's half a second slower over 15, you know, 50 meters. You're still doing 75 miles an hour down to the bottom of the track. You exactly. can't afford to lose the focus, because then it becomes potentially very dangerous indeed. Absolutely. It, there's always a safety concern when it comes to skeleton. We are sliding uh, quite exposed. There's no cowling like you have in bobsled, and we're going head first. And you have to maintain focus even when something like that happens at the start, even if you slip, even if you trip. Uh, it's, it's a tough game. 61.87 seconds. Yes, we're in the field now where we're outside the top 15 in the World Cup points. Yes, these girls aren't expected necessarily to be among the top five or top 10 even. But no, the conditions. And why is the start not being swept? Why is the groove not clear? I couldn't tell you. Uh, the snow is coming down hard. It's coming down really quickly. Oh, here we see the replay. Oh, she gets so sideways on that step. I wonder if she just got in front of her sled or if she just lost grip. But that is not the type of start you want to so see. So snowy there as well. You know, it we is. were walking down the hill and you're teetering because we snow on top of even of, of tarmac is slippery. Snow on ice, you've got no chance. It just Goes. And that's the problem with those brush spikes. They are very effective when the ice is clean, but when there's snow, they do lose their grip. Elena Nikitina, the start record holder at 5.17, does a six. No, what? it's still going. Okay. We, did, we didn't get a start time. My guess is snow got in the way of yep. the timing eye, so we did not get a start okay, time. Okay, so we still have a speed, but we are getting no split times down the track. The clocks are running, but. She should get a time. She, her speed was not there, though. It was below the 60 kilometer an hour mark for the start, which is atypically slow for one of the fastest starters in the field and your reigning Olympic bronze medalist. Well, right now, if you're the Russian coach, you're going back and demanding that this is rerun because it's showing her currently as being 30 seconds uh, or nine tenths of a second behind off a 14 second slower start. So you can't really judge anything on this. You know, it's a decent slide. She, you know, she has a little bit of a skid there going into the labyrinth, but her speeds are not there. Straight from the start all the way through into Kreisel, out of Kreisel, and at the finish. Slow speeds for Elena, unfortunately, and it's going to drop her into 18th place. I rather fear that this heat will not be allowed to count because it's plainly not fair. I mean, Correct. there is a secondary backup timing system, so they may. There is, yes. The, the primary system gives us the TV graphics, gives us the timing screen, but there is a secondary parallel system in case this happens. Exactly. And so they will have a time for her. Yes. Elizabeth yep. Varche is our leader from Jacqueline Lerling and Mirella Raniva. So Canada one and three, but currently Jacqueline Lerling leading the European Championships as we have three sleds left to go. And Coach Mickey Grumberger with the sled for Katie Tannenbaum of the Virgin Islands. Okay. Katie here, she's been working very hard on her starts in the off season and her driving. Her, her driving is coming along. She's been in the sport for quite a few years now and uh, hopefully she'll get a good result, but it's gonna be tough with all of this snow here. 
Second season on World Cup. She's been sliding at the uh, Intercontinental Cup second tier of sliding in North America. Done a lot of work on the tracks there. Yep, she's very familiar with the North American tracks. Not quite as familiar with these European tracks, though. But she'll be doing her best. Uh, she loads on her sled and tries to navigate her way down this deceptively tricky course here in Winterberg. Again, you can see the sled leaving marks in the snow that's gradually building up. I mean, this is a very different track from the one that the first 15 or 20 sleds came down on. It absolutely is. Uh, trying to keep uh, her lines as best as she can as she enters the Kreisel here. You can see those oscillations in the sled. Gets a little bit too much height and a skid off of the end of Kreisel. And you can see how difficult it is for a slider to maintain those parallel runners. It's not just laying on the sled as some people might imagine. You, you do have to steer, you do have to get as much speed as possible, and you're not just along for the ride. 22nd spot on the split times, our 22nd starter. So Katie Tannenbaum, a 62.34 slide. Surely not what she was looking for, but uh, in conditions like this, it's, it's a tough battle, for sure. Yeah. A tough break for Katie Tannenbaum. But Yelena Nikita, the Olympic bronze medalist, came before her and is down in 18th place. So, again, clearly it's not all the athlete. No, it's not. It's uh, unfortunately weather affected yet again. There we see the replay of her coming off of Kreisel and it breaks into a skid. You see her going almost sideways as she enters into curve eight. Makes the correction though, gets herself back together. 22 sleds down, two to come. An ultimate slider is Maria Montecano of Spain. And again, Martin Rettel, one of the bonuses to her season. This is her first World Cup season. And she and teammate Ander Mirambel, one of the, uh, the group being coached by Martin Rettel. And that's really allowed her performance to come up. It really has. 6.41, though, and that's unfortunately slow for Maria. She has no 56.9 kilometers an hour. Lamentably slow, and I've got to say that it has to do with all the extra snow in the start grooves, as she's already 1.8 seconds off of the pace. At the 60-meter clock, she was doing 35 kilometers an hour. The fastest start, she was doing 38, I think, pardon, miles an hour. Three Mile. miles an hour slower. And so now... You know, again, Martin Rettel will be going to the jury going, this is ridiculous. Look at the time she was doing in the start alone in Race. training. Never mind the slide. Look at the start alone. It's not correct. We're having a little bit of a tough time tapping some walls, getting into some corners, not looking as relaxed on her sled as she needs to be as uh, she's scrubbing some more speed, unfortunately. And, uh, and of course, when you've got so little speed compared to what you trained with, exactly. all the corners are wrong, all the steers are wrong. Your timing is you're off. You're falling off things. Absolutely. Yep, it, it plays with you in, in more ways than uh, one might imagine. It's physical, it's mental. Uh, when you have that slow start, you have less velocity going into curve zero. It changes your approach and it changes the way the curve affects you. Here we see the replay. She takes that tap. It's a fairly typical tap going into curve nine. and. Uh, unfortunately, it, it slowed her down just a little bit. But she's got a big smile on her face. She's happy to be there. Yep. Gets it done. And our final slider is Katie Ulender. One on this track, 2006-2007 season. Just right after Torino. Katie's won, I believe, three World Cup medals here before. Yep. She has a lot of experience on this track. And she knows how to slide. She's getting back into her groove, though. She had a little surgical procedure. She was quite ill at the start of the season. And she's trying to find her groove back, and we'll see what the weather does for her today. Well, again, you see the snow in the green. Just see it flipping up as she goes through it. Big marks down to corner zero. 5.98, that is unfortunately slow yet again, 57.9. Earlier on in the field, we saw girls above the 60 kilometer an hour mark. Katie's got an uphill battle for sure. And again, you know, her teammate Annie O'Shea started 5.49 on a clean track. Is Katie Ulender half a second slower? No. Absolutely not. Was she half a second slower in training? No. Definitely not. No. And, and, you know, Tuffy Lutour up at the top is going to be one of a line of coaches, the last six or seven sliders, knocking on the door going, you can't allow this to stand. And as an athlete, though, you don't have any choice. You just have to get yep. out there and slide. You have to put on the speed suit and put on your helmet and give it the best you got, despite the conditions.
Katie's having a fairly relaxed slide. She's doing what she can. Good line. She's not skidding anywhere, but still just drifting away over two seconds behind the pace. Yeah. Three miles an hour slower in the bottom corner. So she did well to adapt to the lack of pace because that's a very different track from the one that she slid on. And Tuffy Latour doesn't exactly look jubilant. Oh, you could see his face yeah. there. Katie's better than a top 20 finish on this track. As you say, you know, post-Olympic season winner. She took bronze the next year. Oh, and she is. She doesn't know what's going on. She gives it well, a shrug. And... She knows exactly what's going on, and so do we. What we don't know is what's going to happen next. Exactly. The jury will have a very tough call to make at the end of this race, and uh, it's anybody's guess what they're going to decide. Well, they have one of two chances. Let it stand and allow Elizabeth Varche to win it, and then just write off the last seven or eight sleds and say tough luck with the weather, or we go again some other time at some other place. Elizabeth Varche is the fastest woman down the hill. She set a great start. She had a great run. To take the lead from Jacqueline Learning is never an easy task. Will the race actually stand in the end? I think the jury have a little bit of deliberation to do. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Varche with an astonishingly good drive here. Mumrita down at the bottom of the track to greet her. Well, that's the result as we see it at the moment. Jacqueline Lurling in the silver medal position for the third consecutive year on this track. Mimi Raniva in the bronze. Janine Flock would take European silver behind Jacqueline Lurling with Tina Herman in the bronze medal position. Do slightly fit, and unfortunately for the first maybe 15 sliders down to Elizabeth Varche, certainly by the time we got to Marina Gilardoni, to be starting maybe two tenths and more slower than she should have done. You could see that the conditions were not equal, and from her on down, everybody else just died a death in the snow. Well, who'd be a jury member? Yesterday, we sat out for 30 minutes for the second heat of the men's, of men's bobsleigh, the two-man. Got it done, but there were a couple of sleds in the middle, only two, really, and particularly Justin Cripps, who ran into the teeth of a snowy blizzard that then almost immediately it had started died away. And so in the end, you had to say, OK, predominantly it was a race and there was a little bit of weather going on here. We had 15 clean slides. We had nine who didn't. So fully a third of the field didn't get a fair crack. Uh, I mean, Nathan, you know, it's, it's the devil's own job being a jury member when the weather sets in like this. But as an athlete, if you were in the second half of the field, you'd be looking for a rerun sometime, someplace. I right? would be, certainly. If I, if I were at one of those final racers to go down the hill, it's a tough pill to swallow. You, you definitely do not have the same conditions that the racers at the start of the race had. And it's, it's tough. Uh, the jury has a very tough call to make here. Which way they go, anybody's guess. Well, we'll wait and see. Hopefully they will get uh, their heads together and make a decision immediately. I'm sure they were seeing exactly what we were seeing. They were seeing really fast starters. I mean, Marina Giardoni is among the fastest at any track. Second or third fastest start should be what she produces. And in the end, Marina, eighth fastest start. Doesn't sound that bad, but when she's 15 hundreds, two tenths of a second away, then that's, you know. Something's amiss, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and Yelena Nikita, you know, start record holder at the Olympic Games, and, and her start didn't get her anything better than 18th position. All right, it was a scrappy ride, but you've got to, you've got to look at, at, at how fair it was at the start area, because that carries so much weight down this track. Absolutely. As it is, though, we have finished our only heat here in Winterberg, so we'll have to wait and see what time brings. A snow-affected Winterberg race for the European Championships in women's skeleton. As the result stands after one snow-affected heat, Jacqueline Lurling would be your European champion. From Janine Flock, who takes a second silver medal in three years, and Tina Herman, the bronze. And in the overall rankings, Canada posted a 1-3 finish, the best in women's skeleton on this track ever for Canada, certainly in the last decade. Elizabeth Arche, whatever else happened later in the run, she produced a big start. Nathan Crumpton, she produced a blistering run, not just to lead 
to the Chrysal, but all the way Through to the, the finish. Chrysal and all the way to the finish. She had a great run. It reflected one of her better training runs. She's comfortable on this track. She's got great equipment. Pulled away with the victory. Oh, jubilation for her. Very happy with her mum, Rita, down there to support her. Jacqueline Lerling in the silver medal position, but that would promote Jacqueline a little further ahead of Janine Flock in the World Cup standings. Tina Herman remains third. Elizabeth Varche moves up to fifth position behind Lizzie Arnold, having come in here uh, in seventh spot. So that would be the big change in the top half dozen. Uh, if the race stands and we may not know before we go off air whether or not the result will change I'm sure the jury will try and make that deliberation as quickly as possible I'm Waiting to hear anything from the jury room at the top of the track at the moment. But there is your top three third place Mimi Reneva from Canada second position Jacqueline Lerling from Germany and Elizabeth Varche our race winner. Well, none of them have much to worry about in the snow, in this heat, but it's what happened to the followers after Elizabeth Arche that may change the result. Meanwhile, you can't wipe the smile off her face because whatever else happens, she produced a sparkling drive to be the fastest in the field. My thanks to Nathan Crumpton for joining us and great words of wisdom during a snowy and difficult race. Well done on your debut, my friend. I'm Martin Haven. Join us next time out for skeleton action from Samaritz in Switzerland. And we still have the four-man bobsleigh race to come here in Winterberg. We'll see you then. Bye for now.